Welcome to viewers from around the world joining us on this uh, poignant and reflective day of Tish Av. We are, of course, at the heart of the, uh, the commemoration is the, uh, and, and the most tragic day in the Jewish year is, of course, the destructions of both Batei Mikdash, both temples, when we reflect on what this means for us today and what are the steps that need to be taken spiritually, internally, in order to please God have the rebuilding of the temple, Bimher of Yamenu. We are very, very blessed to be joined today for this session by three uh, wonderful speakers, thinkers, um, public intellectuals, people who have a stand and what to say about this very important issue. And in alphabetical order, to welcome Rabbi Yehuda Glick, previous member of parliament, president of the Shalom, of the Shalom Jerusalem Foundation, an activist for the Temple Mount, as we all know, Yossi Klein Halevi, senior fellow at the Shalom. Hartman Institute, celebrated author and speaker, Mrs. Eve Harrow, of course, also a uh, podcaster, a, a well-known tour guide and speaker. And all three of you, thank you so much for joining us for this, uh, this important session. We look so forward to hearing your views. Of course, as we know, what better time than Tisha B'Av to reflect on the Temple Mount. And incredibly, time, time and time again, just as we saw in Guardian of the Walls, somehow, when it comes to confrontation, especially with Hamas, as it has in their insignia and their flag, it always comes down to the Temple Mount. There's always something that is metzitata ezor, which precipitates this um, confrontation. It's always somehow related to the Temple Mount, in many ways the crux of the conflict. And I really want to ask each one of you to reflect on what you think the correct Jewish view today should be to the Temple Mount. It's the Makoma Mikdash, the, the place that we hope and pray that will be rebuilt soon speed in our days and still not so much tragedy, death and destruction uh, related somehow to, to conflict around this very holy place. What should be our attitude? Once again, Hamas points to the Temple Mount and issues in the Temple Mount as a justification to unleash this um, non-stop barrage of uh, rockets against Israel and missiles, and with all the you know the, the challenges that they cause, and now within Israeli society as well, fissures that many didn't see coming, but somehow all comes down to the Temple Mount. What should our response be to the Temple Mount today, and in the hope of its rebuilding of the Beit Hamikdash in the future, as we reflect on Tisha B'Av? Can start with you, Rabbi Yehuda Gluck. Rabbi Yehuda Glick, what should our response be, the Temple today? Thank you so much, Rav Doron, and uh, it's always. Uh a great privilege and an honor to speak to Am Israel via Mizrahi and uh, to compliment you on your wonderful work and uh, to send a warm regard to Am Israel from all over, to all over the world from Yerushalayim. Uh, to your question, I think that uh, uh, we all have been witnessing in the last uh, decades, almost a century, uh, the return of Am Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael, and we all refer to it as a fulfillment of the prophecies of the prophets. And uh, the movement of the return to Am Yisrael, to Eretz Yisrael was called Zionism. And in the Bible, Zion, Zion is the name of the Temple Mount, my Zion, my holy mountain. And it, it's, not, it's not by coincidence that it was called Zionism, because the concept is that the people of Israel uh, don't only have a history, but we also have a destiny. And the destiny is to serve as a light upon the nations. The destiny is to turn uh, the, the place which represents God's presence in the world, the Temple Mount, to a house of prayer for all nations. And the way to do it is to go up to the Temple Mount and to promote dialogue there, to teach people to respect each other, to uh, encourage people to come up and, 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 and be inclusive to others on the Temple Mount. Leaving the Temple Mount uh, without representation of people who believe in shalom and just leaving it in the hands of people who are encouraging incitement and hate is, is something that is, that is definitely, in my eyes, a desecration of God's name in the place that God chose to rest his name. And therefore, uh, in, the, uh, in, in my eyes, in the eyes of Isaiah, in the eyes of Micha, our uh, activity should, should be whatever we can to promote the Temple Mount as a place to fulfill the prophecy of uh, you turning our uh, ammunition 
into agriculture uh, instruments, turning uh, our uh, the Temple Mount into a place that unites nations, uh, calling out in the name of the one God, one world, one God. And uh, that's our destiny, that's our mission, that's our assignment as a people of Israel. And uh, that, that's what I believe should be done. The more people that go up to Temple Mount, people who believe in the harmony, in the uh, and diversity in respect to others, the more the Temple Mount will become a holy place. Holy, in my eyes, sacred place is a place that it includes. The late, the late Rav uh, Sachs used to say, the closest, the, 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 if you weigh, the way to measure how close the person is to, is to Hashem is as much as he is inclusive of others. And the more you're inclusive, the closer you are to Hashem. And if we can turn the location, the Temple Mount, into a place which represents the widest kind of inclusiveness possible. If we can turn the place into a place that is open, open-minded, a place that that allows prayer for all people who were created in God's image, to all human beings, uh, and to have it a place that announces shalom upon the world, that 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 should be what our goal should be. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rav uh, Yehuda, for that, those introductory comments. Uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, Yossi Klein Halevi, um, do you agree with the comments of Rav Yehuda? What do you think is the destiny of the Temple Mount, especially in light of the re recent conflicts and ongoing conflict which somehow keeps returning to this particular place? I agree with everything that Yehuda says in terms of the vision. Uh, the deep disagreement between us is over timing. And um, Yehuda quotes uh, the prophets, uh, the, the, the Nevi'im. Um, the Nevi'im didn't give us a timetable. I, I, I'm waiting for a Navi to arise in Israel. Uh, I'm waiting actively for Mashiach, and I'm not saying that rhetorically. I, I am truly actively waiting for Mashiach. Uh, I don't know when he's coming. I don't know when the vision that Yehuda so beautifully articulated uh, can be fulfilled. What I do very much believe is that the premature attempt to force that vision onto a reality that cannot sustain it, which is the current reality. It cannot sustain that beautiful vision of harmony on the Temple Mount. Any attempt to change the status quo on the Temple Mount results in violence, God forbid, in, in the deaths of, uh, of Israelis. And that nothing, nothing threatens the peace of Jerusalem uh, more immediately than the slightest change in the status quo on the Temple Mount. We've seen it time and time again. And so I cannot take responsibility uh, for, God forbid, uh, the loss of Jewish lives uh, in an attempt to, to uh, prematurely fulfill these, this beautiful messianic vision. And more than that, the, the, uh, the attempt to, to impose the messianic vision uh, prematurely uh, is um, is a kind of a, a spiritual arrogance. Uh, and I have to say that um, Yehuda Glick is somebody who I personally admire very much. Uh, I think he's a wonderful man. I, I, I have heard numerous interviews with you, Yehuda, and I, 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 always, I, I always come away inspired, except when it comes to the practical details. And I'll say something that uh, I, I don't know whether you'll take as a compliment. I don't know how you'll take this. <laughs> it's meant as half a compliment. Uh, I think that there, are, there is no one more humane, no one who truly believes in peace and coexistence uh, more sincerely in the state of Israel uh, than Yehuda Glick. And there is no one who inadvertently, without intending to, uh, endangers the peace of Israel more directly uh, than Yehuda Blick. Thank you, uh, 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 Yossi, for those, uh, those uh, clear, strong and striking words. Um, Eve, what are your views? What are your views about what has happened in recent times, how it keeps coming about through 
sensitivities around the, sen- the, the, the Temple Mount. What should our attitude be? What should the way forward be, in your opinion, Eve Harrow? So, um, and excuse me for my, I'm losing my voice. Um, the Temple Mount is, is a symbolic place. I mean, the absence of a temple, that's really what it is. It's not, we don't have the physical place to go up to. But I think that a good part of the problem here can be solved actually within, it's in our hands. Um, we have been giving out messages that uh, have a lack of clarity and um, are very ambiguous over the last few years. And uh, I mean, some of this is experience that I've gained by, by mothering or by parenthood. If you want to get a certain behavior, you have to be very, very clear about where you want that behavior to go. And what we have done around the Temple Mount is give out mixed messages. On the one hand, 1967, Harabai, Begadenu. And then we, to some degree, humiliate ourselves. And Rob Gorin admitted it afterwards also, that blowing the chauffeur, for example, at the Kotel was a mistake. We live in the Middle East. We don't we don't live by ourselves here in the Middle East. And we have to be very aware of how our neighbors think. It's not just about how we see things and how we want a vision of a world peace, which is all through our prayers and all through our history. And there's no people that has been more persecuted and has cried out more for peace. However, we don't have enough self-respect. So I hear what Robin Hood is saying, and it's it's beautiful about, and, and you'll see to that degree also, about going up there and having mutual respect and, and worrying about the timing. But we are not showing that we respect ourselves. I can't control other people, and I think a good part of Judaism is actually the message of Judaism is learning to control ourselves and maybe a little bit beyond. And that's much harder than trying to control other people. So I can't control the reactions of other people if I go up there. But what I can do is make it very, very clear that just as I respect other religions and other people's right to connect with God, which is after all what prayer is supposed to be about, connecting with God, I also have the right to connect with God on my holiest site. And therefore, I think that we should have a synagogue on the Temple Mount. We should make it very clear that the Muslims can come and pray and the Jews can come and pray. We can go from there. But that we do not demean ourselves. What happened this last Jerusalem day when there was terrorism coming off the Temple Mount, when Jews were stoned and Jews were forced off the Temple Mount, and the Israeli government then didn't allow Jews on the Temple Mount. They rewarded the perpetrators of violence was the exact wrong message that needed to be sent. And just as I think that this shouldn't happen on the Temple Mount, we see the ramifications of this kind of attitude in a lot of the things that we do here in Israel, very far from Jerusalem. So the Temple Mount is actually an issue that's much bigger than just should we go up and pray there and should we not? And I hear what Yossi is saying, and I understand completely what he's saying about the loss of life as the mother of soldiers, as the mother of children and grandchildren living here, 100%. However, you could say that about Israel in general, about the fact that we have an army and we're risking lives all the time in order to keep a space for ourselves. And I think that the messaging on the Temple Mount has to be much clearer that we have the right to go and pray on the Temple Mount, again, with mutual respect for others, but this is not a right that should be taken away from ourselves. And the fact that a Jewish government is doing that really humiliates us in the eyes of our neighbors. And that's a very, very dangerous place to be in, in the jungle of the Middle East. Thank you very much, uh, Eve, for those words. Um, I'm going to hand back to uh, Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda, um, uh, Yossi expressed very deep uh, and genuine respect towards you before we came on live, afterwards, and there's a genuine, deep, uh, mutual respect. But he made a very sharp comment. He said that, on the one hand, there's enormous respect and belief in your desire for peace in the Middle East and uh, a place of um, making space for others, inclusivity, as you quoted, rough sex, and a genuine desire. But yet, he stated that your actions achieve exactly the opposite and in many ways endanger peace. What would your response to that be, to respond to that comment of Yossi and to respond to anything else Yossi or Eve has said? Uh, first of all, I was quite insulted when he said that I'm the most person promoting peace in this country. I think there are so many wonderful people in this country who are doing so many great things to bring about the peace. And uh, I, I really thank him for the compliments. But I, I, want, I wanted to say that... Uh, um, in my eyes, uh, I, I do understand 
people who are afraid of uh, things that, that, that cause danger. But I, I, I must point out two things, and those are the most important things. First of all, keeping away from Temple Mount and leaving it in the hands of those who incite terror does not uh, re, uh, 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 decrease the amount of terror in this area. It only increases it. Running away from terror only gives terror an appetite to continue terror, just like moving out of Gush Katif uh, just brought the missiles uh, deeper into the, into the state of Israel. But uh, the other point, and that is most important for me, unfortunately, uh, I, I mean, I respect people who don't want to go up to Temple Mount. I, I definitely respect, just like I respect anybody who has his, his, his opinions. What I do want to do, and that's most important, is to raise the awareness that it should be, a, 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 I would say, a realistic awareness, awareness of the understanding of the central role and the destiny of the Jewish people. Very often we tend to forget that. Very often we tend to go to the Kotel and totally forget where our goal is. And our goal is to announce God's kingdom over the world on Temple Mount. Our goal is to get the world to recognize that. I can say that in the past few years, we've seen how more and more countries who we've never believed have, 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 have gone towards peace with Israel. We've seen in the past, uh, the last decades where we got used to it, we take it for granted that there are Christians that are supporting Israel, something that, we, that, that probably nobody in the world could have dreamt it throughout the history of the people of Israel. Things are happening. It, it, it just like the state of Israel was established not in one day, it was a process. And we went through, we paid a very, very heavy price. Even the very first years, I'm sure if somebody would have come in 1949 and would have said, listen, it wasn't worth it all, we paid such a, a terrible price, we would, probably wouldn't have what to answer. But if we look at the whole thing in a perspective of a long-term perspective, and I, and I definitely do not encourage anybody to do anything illegal. I definitely encourage to do everything with respect. I don't think that a person who prays, that a person who respects others can be blamed for violence. And uh, therefore, I, I will continue to encourage people to ascend Temple Mount peacefully. And I will continue to encourage those who don't ascend Temple Mount not to forget the central role that Temple Mount plays in, 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 our, in the Jewish uh, destiny. And that we as Zionists are not waiting for Messiah to do, to do it. We are doing whatever is in our ability to promote uh, this destiny. And I hope that on Tisha B'Av that we're marking today, we'll, uh, we'll all uh, take that and remember that and, and remind ourselves that that's our, our goal as a people of Israel. Uh, Yossi, uh, uh, just to call upon you, at the end of the day, both, um, both Eve and now Rav Yud has articulated that is the stance that you are proposing, while understandable from a conservative point of view, not wanting to rock the boat and the incendiary nature of anything which happens in the Temple Mount, but is it not rewarding terror? Is it not strengthening the, uh, you know, um, regimes which, uh, you know, either terrorize or support these, uh, you know, acts of terror? And are we not compromising ourselves? Are we not compromising ourselves and our own rights to these places to pray and etc.? And maybe perhaps also just to reflect on, uh, you know, when it comes somehow, I think mentioned by Eve, when it comes to the state of Israel and Zionism, we've been uh, very proactive in wanting to shape the future of Jewish destiny. Somehow mm -hmm. when it comes to the Temple Mount, there's a view which says that specifically here we need to be passive. It's almost like we become Satmar when it comes to the Temple Mount. Here we mustn't touch, we mustn't be proactive. We must sort of wait for things to unfold without sort of human um, interaction. How would you respond to these uh, different voices reflected both by Yehuda and uh, specifically by Eve as well? Bechavod, uh, Yossi. If you look at the, uh, the history of violence in Jerusalem, especially in recent years, since, since the end of the Second Intifada, since we defeated the Second Intifada, any major outbreak of violence was always related to a change in the status quo in the Temple Mount. Nothing rouses violence among the Palestinians in Jerusalem more than changes on the Temple Mount. Um, when the embassy, the American embassy was moved to, to Jerusalem, there, was, there, were, there were no riots in, uh, in the city. It's only when something happens on the Temple Mount, that's what galvanizes Palestinian violence. So that's in terms of rewarding terror. In this case, I would say the terror that happens within Jerusalem in terms of 
of the mass violence, the mob violence, that is a direct result of changes uh, in the status quo or attempts to change the status quo in Jerusalem. Now, as far as the argument that that this that the the Satmar or the Haredim use the same line of reasoning to say we can't interfere with uh, with God's plan and the land of Israel. Um, I heard from a uh, a student of uh, of Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook uh, that uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda said that when it comes to the Temple Mount, he is Nature Karta. Now, if you look at the the strong majority of rabbinic opinion uh, in Israel uh, regarding the Temple Mount, uh, the the weight is is very much against tampering. Uh, with uh, with the status quo, the Temple Mount is different. It has a different status. Think about David HaMelech, our in some ways our greatest king, and yet he was not permitted to build the temple because his hands had shed blood. And so the rules that apply to conquest in the land of Israel, the rules that apply to Zionism, to Jewish pride, to, to, to deterrence, stop at the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is other. The Temple Mount is Yerushalayim Shalmala. And to try to apply the rules of Yerushalayim Shalmata to Yerushalayim Shalmala is a very, very dangerous spiritual move, first of all. Politically, it's, it's, uh, it, it, there is nothing that risks rousing the entire Muslim world in a united front against Israel than tampering with the Temple Mount. How can any of us take responsibility for that? How can you take responsibility for triggering, God forbid, a world jihad against the state of Israel? Now, we obviously, we are fighting terrorism. There is jihad against Israel, but it has not by any means united the Muslim world. The Muslim world is very divided. Even the Arab world, as we're seeing, and Yehuda made reference to this earlier, the Abraham Accords, other ch- other changes that are happening in the Arab world. Nothing endangers our position, our physical safety in the Middle East more, more than the Temple Mount. And again, I really, I want to respond directly to you, Eve, that to talk about pride and deterrence, I'm with you completely. Whatever we need to do for military deterrence, I'm there. Whatever we need to do to assert Israeli pride, Jewish pride, I'm with you. Except when it comes to the Temple Mount. And there, David HaMelech, King David, is standing at the gate and warning us. The rules that apply to the rest of this land do not apply here. This is the heart of the heart of God's land. And we leave this part, this small part, we leave for Mashiach and we leave for God's plan. So like Rav Tzvi Yehuda, when it comes to, to the Temple Mount, I'm the Turei Kanta. Thank you, uh, Yossi, for that clarification. Eve, I'm giving you an opportunity to respond both to what uh, Rav Yehuda said and to what uh, Yossi has said in terms of uh, your, your view in light of their responses? Look, I'm not blind to what Yossi is saying about uniting the Arabs. Look, the jihad is going on anyway. Our concerns about Iran, our concerns about a jihadist state that wants to destroy Israel, and the Temple Mount is not the issue, okay? The Muslim countries around us, the jihadist Muslim countries around us are gonna do everything they can to destroy us no matter what is happening on the Temple Mount. But his point is an excellent point, that we don't need to be the ones to bring the Shias and the Sunnis together who otherwise hate each other on every other level. And that is an incredibly valid point. However, I wanna, I wanna speak to what he talked about, rabbinic opinion. Because rabbinic opinion, as we all know, goes in many, many different directions. For example, just to take it down off the Temple Mount to the Kotel, which is where many people go and pray in lieu of the Temple Mount, the Kotel itself after 1967, it was very up in the air. Where is the holy place in the Kotel? And where is the archaeological dig? When you go now to the Kotel, so the, the, north, the northern side of the plaza is where people pray. 
Then there's the, the Mugrabi Gate, right? There's the, the walkway up into the Temple Mount. And then there's an archaeological park, but it's an extension of the same Western Wall. So there were many compromises, and this book has just been published by one of my professors this year, Colby Tab Cohen, about what the many, many compromises that were made between the archaeologists and the rabbinate post-67 about what would become the place to pray and what would become the place to walk around in shorts while you're learning about the archaeological record. And there, and it's to a great degree very, very arbitrary. And so I think within that. That is what I would like to see applied. Some kind of compromised position, not necessarily building a synagogue with velvet chairs up on the Temple Mount, but a place, a corner where the Jews have the right to pray, where we are respected. We don't have to sneak up like thieves in the night and pretend to be checking our mail on our phone when we're actually using the app that's the prayer app. All right. And, and I feel that it's important not just for Jews, but for other people to see that. Again, that this is something that we are incredibly devoted to. I don't know what David HaMelech would say. And I don't know all the reasons for why, um, you know, why, yes, there's the, the obvious reason about the bloodshed, but I'm sure there's other reasons as well. And we don't know all the history. What we do know in here with my tour guide hat is that the places where the Beit HaMikdash actually were are a very small place on a very large mount that was essentially just like a plaza. And there are places on that plaza that everybody understands were never a holy site. And just to end with, what makes a place holy, right? And so we have maybe one place that's inherently holy, which is where the Beit HaMikdash was. But for me, what makes a place holy is where I encounter Hashem. So the reason that I will find the Kotel to be a special place is not because there's something inherently holy about the stones, but because of the thousands of years of other people who prayed there and connected to Hashem. And when I go there, I connect with them and their prayers and their connection to Hashem. For me, that's what makes it holy, as opposed to 10 meters south of there that isn't. And we need to create these holy spaces to, again, to connect to God and everybody can connect to God. But I think it's incredibly important, and I'm not going to be afraid of the jihadists, because if we do that, that's an incredibly slippery slope, as I said before. And we have to be able, maybe also to Hashem, to say, this is a miracle. That Why is Harabai Adenu? I mean, why didn't we lose it in 1967? Maybe there's a reason there that we were that our, our paratroopers and others were able to conquer it. Was it so that we could come off? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know, and I don't know if any of us know, we're all kind of bumbling around in the dark. But I do believe that we, there's messages here that we need to give to our own people and to the people around us, to the God-fearing people around us. The ones who aren't God-fearing, there's really no need to talk to them because this is not a place that's speaking to them anyway. It's just a kind of a political hot potato. Thank you, Eve. Uh, so a question for each one of you just to, to reflect on. Um, it's fascinating, the, the different views and the, uh, the challenges of how we, how we view the Temple Mount. It, is it essentially different, as, uh, as Yossi has quoted Rav Tzvi and others, that it's really uh, very different rules. It's more Yerushalayim Shalmala and then operates very different, even from the whole attitude to Eretz Yisrael and, and to Zionism. But to, Rav Yudah, perhaps to ask you, um, Yossi makes a strong point. The, it seems that a significant majority of rabbis, including the chief rabbinate of Israel, including the rabbis, Rav Tzudah Kuk and the rabbis of Merkaz Rav, many of them, which emanated from, uh, you know, from Merkaz Rav, and so many others, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, are, are, are very conservative, would rather err on the side of cons on being conservative here, especially because it's something which has the spiritually incendiary nature to really, uh, God forbid, evoke a world war. And, um, and uh, is there not room, perhaps, to be more conservative, to be more careful when it comes to such a sensitive place as the Temple Mount? Uh, Rav Yehuda. Uh, listen, I, I really have to uh, refer to a few things that were said before that saddened me very much uh, uh, that the uh, Yossi, whom I really respect, said. Uh, first of all... Uh, I'll start with the, the fact that he talks about the, the rabbis who are against Temple Mount. I, I'm, I'm sure there are more rabbis in Israel who are against the Hartman Institute than there are against the, the Temple Mount. 
uh, including the ra- you, you can ask the rabbis of of of, of uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda's Talmidim what they think about uh, the Hartman Institute, what it represents, what the the feministic uh, revolution that we've seen here in Judaism in the past the few years. Something that I, I I see as part of Geula, and something that the rabbis are 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 against. Rabbis, by definition, are usually very conservative, and therefore the the mass majority of rabbis were against the Zionism at all in the beginning, and definitely the mass majority of rabbis today are against many of things that we do, and that I'm very proud of uh, ordaining their new uh, women rabbis, uh, the fact that 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 women are taking a much more um, um, active par- part in in our Judaism. Something that I believe that in a time rabbis will get used to. Secondly, I'm even more saddened when I hear Yossi, who I refer to as a real professional, uh, being, uh, I would say, uh, buying the uh, the Muslim propaganda. The uh, it's just I'm really saddened because what he said as facts have nothing to do with the facts. I'll just give an example: the past uh, round of the violence we saw. In this area, from from Gaza, etc., and we saw in the, in February, the, uh, the 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 Hamas had announced that if these can, the, the elections in the Palestinian Authority will be canceled, then there will be a, a round of violence. Now, if the, what the what the Muslims love doing is. One, uh, there was nothing with the past round on the te- uh, 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 violence with the Temple Mount. Nothing happened there. There was no change of any status quo. The violence was ma- majorly because of the cancellation of the of the of the elections in Judea and Samaria. And the Palestinians said, "Well, let's call it the El uh, inter- the El Aqsa Intifada." Nothing happened on El Aqsa. As a matter of fact, the only thing that happened was that Israel closed down Temple Mount for three weeks. Something that we haven't done for a long time. The only thing that happened was that Israel canceled the the uh, the march of Jerusalem. So everything that was done was actually uh, against the 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 the, uh, the the interest of those who were promoting the. Uh, I would say the uh, the national uh, that uh, this propaganda that the Muslims have an interest that people uh, follow was was picked up as a fact. By, by by Yossi, there is nothing ever that 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 started uh, that began on Temple Mount that caused that caused violence. The same story. Uh, all the Israeli intelligence agree that the uh, the second Intifada had nothing to do with Arik Sharon's going up to Temple Mount. Once he went up to Temple Mount, they said, "Oh, we got a great excuse." But it was quite obvious to everybody that the violence of the second Intifada was there. So again and again, Temple Mount does not promote violence. Temple Mount promotes peace. Temple Mount promotes uh, uh, respect to each other, and more Jews that go up to Temple Mount are uh, are are the people that that are causing peace. And therefore, I do not want to take on my responsibility any bloodshed in this neighborhood. And therefore, I call upon Jews to go up to Temple Mount. The more Jews peacefully going up to Temple Mount, and not only Jews, Christians, Muslims, anybody who goes up to Temple Mount with a peaceful, respect uh, and inclusive uh, ideology. And, and his behavior is a behavior of promoting respect to one another, he will bring peace to the Temple Mount. And anybody who says, let's get away from the Temple Mount, is, is endangering us and is bringing more terror to the country and is encouraging more and more people, uh, 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 radical people, to want to bring uh, 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 violence. And I want to show that the one thing that, that, that re- reduced majorly the violence in Jerusalem was a decision by the state of Israel to outlaw all of those violent people who were going onto the Temple Mount until five years ago, every Jew who went up to the Temple Mount was it was a, 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 a in fight. And uh, and today, thanks to the fact that, that Israel outlawed them, today on Temple Mount, anybody who comes to visit, and you'll see you're more than welcome to come visit, you'll see that the visit to Temple Mount today is, is a peaceful thing and, it, and, and quiet. And we pray there, and 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 and, and it's not bringing about any any violence. I myself take groups up Temple Mount every single week, and 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 a place of peace and quiet. Thank you, uh, Rav Yehuda. We did lose you for a little a little bit of the time with the connection, but we got most of what you said. 
So really, uh, if I crystallize, um, you'll see what I uh, understand you to be saying is that the last round did not seem to emanate directly from anything that Israel did on the Temple Mount. It was just, uh, you know, it was, next, it was Sheikh Jarrah. That was the official reason given, not the Temple Mount. And then, and then violence broke out in the Temple Mount. And then uh, just over 20 years ago, when Sharon went up to the Temple Mount, Rav Yehud is saying that uh, it seemed from Israeli intelligence that that was just the, uh, you know, that was just the excuse used. It was the, uh, it was the to'ena, the pretext. It wasn't really the reason. And therefore, it seems that no matter what Israel does, argues Rav Yehuda, there will always be a way to somehow connect it to the Temple Mount, independent of Israel's behavior, in order to incite uh, violence. Uh, what is your perspective and response to uh to that, I, actually, I actually agree with the two examples uh, that Yehuda raised. The second intifada was not caused uh, by Sharon walking on the Temple Mount, despite what uh, the international media said at the time, and, and much of the international community still believes. Uh, it was being prepared by Arafat well before, and he used that as the pretext. I interviewed Sharon uh, shortly after uh, he he was on, he went on the Temple Mount, and I said to him, "You know, you didn't cause all this violence, but now that you see that the Palestinians used your your visit as a pretext for uh, for uh, for launching the Second Intifada, and have convinced most of the world that you're the reason why they did it," I said, "In in in retrospect, would you have gone up?" And he looked at me with that little Sharon smile, that half smile, which uh, it was his trademark. Uh, and he said, if I, say, if I say to you that I regret it, I'll be saying that Jews don't have the right to go onto the Temple Mount. Now, we can interpret that enigmatic comment uh, in different ways. I imagine Yehuda would interpret it in his direction. Uh, I interpret it in my direction. I interpret it as Sharon saying, uh, winking at me and saying, well, of course I wouldn't have done it if I knew that I was giving Arafat the excuse and the pretext to blame Israel for the war that he was going to launch, but I can't say it. Now, in terms of uh, the most recent fighting, I agree again. I agree with Yehuda. Hamas did not need a pretext. I think that the reason uh, that Hamas launched this war had to do more with internal Palestinian politics. Mahmoud Abbas canceled uh, the most recent uh, Palestinian election. He's now uh, in his 15th or 16th year of a four-year elected term. And so uh, Hamas uh, was playing politics. It wanted to show that it is the champion uh, of Jerusalem. But again, the, the, why, give the, why give them the pretext to be able to promote themselves as the champion? And most of the world accepted it. We lost this round of public opinion. I was very involved in, uh, in the media war. Uh, around uh, this latest round of fighting, and uh, we lost from the beginning. Now, the the you know when Yehuda says that there's net that there's no violence that can be traced to the Temple Mount. I mean, come on. Uh, I'll give you just one example. Uh, when we uh, installed the the uh, um, the the uh, new no, the metal detector machines uh, on Harabait. Uh, which I think we had every right to do, but the Palestinians saw that as as a as an encroachment of Israeli sovereignty, and it created violence. Two Israeli police were killed, and this notion that whatever we do on the Temple Mount will only bring more peace rather rather than violence. Well, that's true in messianic times, in pre messianic times, in the real world that Zionism sought to address. Zionism was a movement of realism. It sought to create a, a to, to re restore the Jewish people to history, to, to, the, to, to the rules of this world. The Temple Mount doesn't fit into that scenario. And Yehuda's beautiful, again, truly beautiful visions uh, belonged more in, uh, in, uh, in, in, our, in our prayers than they do in our politics. 
Thank you uh, for those that clarification. Eve, what are your thoughts yes. listening to Rav Yehuda and now to Yossi's response? What, what are your views in light of um, Well, I have a few, a few comments. Uh, one of them is when we talk about sovereignty on the Temple Mount. So the walkway up to the Mugrabi Gate is in danger of collapse, imminent danger of collapse. The Jerusalem engineer will not sign off on that. And in a year where we have had one tragedy after the other, both in Israel and without, of things collapsing. So Israel is really, on one hand, duty-bound to fix that walkway before people get killed. On the other hand, that's also going to be some kind of statement according to the Muslim world, if that is the benchmark that we use, that we're declaring sovereignty on the Temple Mount. So somebody's going to have to make a decision there, and it's going to have to be very, very soon, or there's going to be a massive tragedy. So we cannot keep saying that, that because they see something that we do as a mark of sovereignty, we can't do it. This isn't a small issue. This is a life or death issue. And that's just one example. Uh, in terms of the court of the opinion of the world, we're never going to have the opinion of the world. I think we constantly need to be trying, and I'm somebody who really feels that we should have a proper PR effort coming from Israel, not a very nice guy in a uniform explaining what Israel is doing, but the best and really the most the most intelligent PR people who are making Israel's case. It's something that should have been done a long, long time ago. But to quote Rabbi, the late Rabbi Sachs, when we've quoted before in the show, Israel has become the excuse for anti-Semitism, and that's a much bigger picture than justifying whether when we took down the building in Gaza, whether we accidentally killed children or not. And that's something that we're constantly going to be fighting against. We need to do the best we can. We need to get an A for effort. But we are never going to win the court of world opinion because most people either don't care, they're stupid, they hate Israel anyway, or they just want to be politically correct, which currently now means being pro-Palestinian. And there's a lot more reasons that I won't get into. Because I do want to make a comment on Ariel Sharon. There is one question that I would really like to ask Ariel Sharon, and that has nothing to do with his walk on the Temple Mount. That would be if he regrets destroying the communities in Gush Katif and opening the door for, for Gaza to now be a Hamas state. So when it comes to quoting Ariel Sharon, half smile or not, not exactly where I'm going, because it's not an individual who might think uh, represented Israeli democracy, let alone any kind of Jewish state that needed to, uh, there were just certain things that were done under his watch, shall we say, that I think were positively the nadir of uh, Israeli democracy and uh, its self-imposed tragedies, really, and that we are still suffering from today. So his walk on the Temple Mount is really a very small thing as compared to what he does on the coast of Israel, which we are going to be paying for for a very, very long time. And I'd like to, to mention, since this is Tisha B'Av, that this is also the 16th anniversary of that terrible time when those people, when fellow Israelis and Jews were thrown out of their homes by the Israeli army. So there's a lot of things that get confused here and they get mixed up here. And I think we have to realize a few things. Our leadership is flawed. Our people are flawed. We're doing the best that we can. Tisha B'Av is a symbol of the infighting that led to the destructions of the temple and many other tragedies in our people's history. And that is what we have to be careful of more than anything else, to keep our people together as much as we possibly can. Yes, we have to worry about what the rest of the world thinks, but the tragedies of Tisha B'Av, to some degree, yes, they were brought on by other people, but the messages that the rabbis give is that if we had only stood together and been united, then possibly we could have averted them. And I think in the magnificent miracle that we have of the modern day state of, of Israel, something that I think about every single day, that I can read the Nevi'im and I'm living what they said, and it never seeks to amaze me. And Mizrahi is a Zionist organization. Uh, so many kudos to Mizrahi for constantly bringing that home, how important the state of Israel is um, with Again, with all its flaws, leadership from left into right into center, the people here are magnificent. Hashem is obviously still with us because he brought us home and he keeps us here every single day, uh, a raid against forces that we can absolutely not imagine. And so, um, yes, I, but I do believe that we need to understand our place in the world, be proud of who we are, be proud of the fact that we were given the Torah and the messages of the Torah, and that we also need to ensure our rights in places 
even if it means that other people will get upset. That is not a reason to not do that. There's a, a much bigger picture here um, than we can even imagine. There's, there's a thousands year, of year old picture here and, and we have the responsibility and the privilege and the joy. And sometimes it absolutely takes my breath away that I have the privilege to be a part of all this. And to try and make wise decisions, I'm not in a position of leadership, so I don't have that ultimate responsibility. But as, as living here, then, then you know, we all have that responsibility. And I just want to thank both Yossi and Rav Yehuda, who, both of whom I admire tremendously, agree with on many things and disagree with on other things as well, um, because they are with me in all of this. And that is the greatest thing of all. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful, Eve, both in terms of your response and in terms of your summation. You'll see, I would like to give you a, uh, an opportunity to share a final word in terms of the context of this debate and discussion and in terms of the fact that it's uh, the reflection for Tisha Abav for all of us going forward. You'll see. Well, thank you. Thank you, Doron. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to be uh, agreeing wholeheartedly with, uh, with, with Eve. I um I like like you Eve I I feel the privilege the responsibility and the burden all all at the same time of being a custodian of this miracle and I live in a constant state of awe and anxiety and that's part of the, the burden of, of our generation. We've been, we, we were privileged to be born into the state. I was part of the first generation, and, and I think uh, my, my co-panelists were as well. Um, we're more or less the same generation uh, that was the first to be born into, into the state of Jewish sovereignty. And that's something that that inspires me and haunts me. And so the argument that we have here is really the Shem Shemayim uh, in, uh, in, in the purest sense, uh, which is also why I, I have deep respect and love for, for both uh, Yehuda and Eve. And, uh, and I understand, I understand the frustration, I understand the anger, I share it, but that's not the principal mode in which I relate to, to, to the issues we've been discussing. Uh, when I think about what we need to do to preserve this miracle of uh, the third commonwealth, what, uh, what secular Zion is called the third temple, which is the state of Israel, I think we need to be guarding against the two sins that were responsible for the Khurban of Bayit Sheni. The first, which we all know and we all repeat often, was uh, the sin of Sinat Chinam, of needless hatred. And I would add that, that along with the sin of needless hatred is also the sin of hatred with a reason. Because it's very easy in the current state of Israel for Jews to find reason to hate other Jews. You're endangering the existence of Israel by building settlements. You're endangering the existence of Israel by opposing settlements. You're endangering the existence of Israel by insisting on a secular state. You're endangering the existence of Israel by imposing a theocracy on Israel. There are, there are any number of ways in which Jews can oppose the positions of other Jews, not just by saying you're wrong, but your position is actually endangering the existence of Israel. And that can create hatred. And so we have to guard against not only needless hatred, but hatred that is based on a reason. That's the first, that's the first great fear that I have. And uh, the election campaigns that we've been through in the last few years uh, have, um, have really allowed a level of hatred to rise into Israeli discourse that is dangerous and, uh, and, a, and a chilul shem am Yisrael. It's a desecration of the name of the Jewish people. The second great danger that we need to guard against is kanaut, zealotry. 
And we forget that that's a very important part of the story of how we lost sovereignty and how we lost the Second Temple. By the actions of small groups of fanatics uh, who were so sure that their way was going to, to lead to, to victory, to redemption. And they turned out to be tragically wrong. And the two fears that, that I live with are, are sin'at chinam, and, uh, or sin'ah in general, and, uh, and kana'ut. And uh, my, my, my kavanah on, tisha, on every Tisha B'Av is that, that we, we learn to overcome the hatred, the schism within Jewish people, and that we learn to contain the temptation of zealotry. And I know that temptation very well from my own personal life. When I was a teenager, uh, I was active in the Jewish Defense League with Mayor Kahana. I know the temptation of Kanaut. And that's all the more reason why I fear it and why I am, I am desperate to protect the Temple Mount, which is a volcano, the most, the most sensitive ground in the Middle East, maybe in the world to protect the Temple Mount from well-intentioned zealotry. And uh, that's my prayer for Tisha B'Av, that we, that we find the capacity to understand each other, to love each other, and uh, to protect ourselves from zealotry. Thank you, really, Yossi, for those beautiful words. Eve, for your beautiful words. Rabbi Yehuda, earlier, for his uh, wonderful words. And really, I feel really privileged to be a uh, part of such a panel and to listen to the three of you because uh, when you hear the three of you speak, we're in many areas the views of very divergent, palpable, deep respect. There's a palpable sense of um, respectable discourse, even though one feels that the views espoused by the other in many ways are exactly not what should be done. You mentioned, Yossi, the concept of, uh, you know, machloket l'shem shamayim, and I saw beautifully uh, um, the uh, the clear car mentioning bringing the Gemara on what's a machloket l'shem shamayim. We know that Chazal say that uh, shamayim, heaven in Hebrew, is made up of two words, eshmayim, eshmayim, water and fire. There could not be two different elements. The one vaporizes the other, the other one extinguishes the other, and they could not be at more odds one with the other. Yet L'Shem Shamayim is when something is done for the sake of heaven, it's, it's done for the sake of finding a space, a makom, for the most divergent view, views, for such different views. And um, that both can somehow be part of the same tapestry of opinion and accepted as legitimate views within the very, very broad and differentiated views. And I echo what you've said also, you'll see that I think it's been concerning for many of us, the level of discourse around the world in general, in Israel over the last two and a half years with the many different elections, how easy it seems to flow off the tongue of people to delegitimize the other with such cause, um, such um, painful and, uh, you know, um, coarse wording of being able to delegitimize so quickly. And I, I've come out of this so inspired but the level of this discourse, the love and respect, despite the difference of views, we hope and pray as we sit together in Tisha Be'av and reflect on the meaning of the temple, that we should mar be'avat chinam, we should mar the ability to find room for different views, and together, Bezrat Hashem, be able to uh, witness the rebuilding of the full rebuilding of Shalai in the temple in our days. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, Thank you very much. Be it's